uh, when independence came, the Sinhala leadership tried to redress 1,400 years of grievances in the course of two or three years. The ethnic divide was reinforced by language and religion. Tamils were Hindu or Christian. Most Sinhalese were devout Buddhists. At independence, Buddhist leaders wanted Buddhism to be given a preeminent place. Sinhalese politicians wanted greater prominence for their language. It was a potent alliance. A powerful strand of Sinhalese nationalism was born. At independence, you had elite politicians basically in power. Elite politicians who needed some kind of connection with rural masses and Buddhist nationalism through its populism, through its symbolism, provided that connection with rural voters. Nationalism is a very good vote winner in any, any country. So they bred this nationalism, they nurtured it. Um, to, so in, in, in order to do that, they had to discriminate against the Tamils. They had to show that the majority is given priority. In 1956, a new political party emerged. Riding the tiger of Sinhalese nationalism, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party swept to power, promising to make Sinhala the official language. The party had an unlikely leader, Solomon Bandranayaka. His father was Sir Solomon Bandranayaka. He was a product of Eton, and uh, Oxford, Balliol College, great scholar, classics, could hardly speak a word of singular, was a total Englishman in, a, in his cultural habits, in his language. He paradoxically led the singular renaissance. By the time the new parliament convened, the Tamil minority was agitated. In his opening address, the Governor-General tried to explain that the Tamil language would be given reasonable use. His words cut little ice. It was totally an unjust discriminatory legislation against the Tamil people because we, are, we were deprived of our use of language. Under this particular legislation, the Tamil people were forced to learn Singhala language to, f to gain admission, not only in universities, gain admission in the civil service. So that is one of the reasons uh, that led to the current ethnic uh, conflict. The debate is on uh, whether it was the correct thing to do or whether it was a short-sighted policy in the, in the long term. After 1956, with the marginalizing of the Tamil people, not only were the Tamils humiliated, or at least they felt humiliated, but there also emerged on both sides of the divide a whole new generation. The Sinhala could speak only Sinhala, and the Tamil could speak only Tamil. And there was no way they could communicate with each other. So you had Singular leadership had virtually created two nations. One small island, two languages, two nations. The ethnic divide was in place. The first serious anti-Tamil riots erupted in 1956. More would punctuate the next 25 years. It erupted very badly. Hundreds of people were killed. This all ended dividing the Tamils and the Sinhala people um, and the political agendas being set really on an ethnic basis. The seeds of ethnic conflict were now sown. But Prime Minister Bandaranayaka had no qualms. Mr. Prime Minister, the introduction of Sinhalese as the official language by your government appears to a visitor to have damaged the good relations which previous, previously existed between Sinhalese and Tamils. 
How do you justify this act? Well, when our country became independent, naturally the question arose of uh, national language superseding English as the official language of the country. Singhalese we decided upon as the official language because 70% of the people of Ceylon are Sinhalese. At the same time, we naturally re realized that uh, the Tamil minority had a language that was also old, a very rich language in literature, so on. And therefore, we decided also to give a reasonable use to the Tamil language as the language of a national minority. In such matters as education, examinations for the public service, correspondence and so on. We feel that that is the fairest way in which the problem could have been settled. Mr. Bandaranaika bears some of the responsibility for the uh, ghastly history of Sri Lanka because uh, he opened the door to Sinhalese extremism uh, first of all by favoring Sinhala as the only official language but much worse than that by giving way to extremists when they put him under pressure. He turned out not to be a tough prime minister who could resist when pressures built up upon him. Solomon Bandranayaka didn't live to see the bitter fruit of his language policy. In 1959 he was assassinated in a business dispute, ironically by a Buddhist monk. He was succeeded by his widow, Siramavo, the world's first female prime minister, but politically inexperienced. With no agenda of her own, she decided to carry through her husband's policies, particularly on the language issue. By now, Tamil politicians in the northern city of Jaffna had begun a campaign of peaceful protest. Neville Jayawira was a government civil servant throughout the period. When I went to Jaffna as the government agent, that was in 1963, I was 33 years old, the people were Jaffna, the Tamil people, were already in rebellion. My mandate upon going to Jaffna was to quell the rebellion and literally to bring the Jaffna people to heal. They demonstrated all the time, they marched in powerful and long processions, they burnt effigies of the Prime Minister and of the government agent. Uh, but all of which I allowed as a government agent because I felt they had a right to do so, uh, much to the chagrin of the government in Colombo, I must say. British interest still dominated the Sri Lankan economy. When world commodity prices dropped, unemployment rocketed. Educated but without jobs, young Sinhalese men were increasingly disaffected. A new party sprang up, wedded to violence, the People's Liberation Front, or JVP. They were a highly ideological party, founded and led by a man called Rahana Wijiwera, who was um, trained at the Sorbonne. He came back to establish fully-fledged Marxist party which was pledged to overthrow the established order in Sri Lanka which he, or Ceylon as it then was, which he held to be so corrupt that it was beyond redemption and had to be replaced. A year after its formation, the JVP launched its first armed uprising. The Prime Minister, Mrs. Bandranayaka, reacted by sending in troops. Come, 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 come out, come out. JVP militants used makeshift weapons to attack police stations and government offices. These people were largely from the peasant. And students who had been educated in Singhala, who had no knowledge of English, and this was one of their main grievances that they could never get good jobs in Colombo, in the private sector,